Well, uh, this project has been going for a little bit less than a year, and it started as a bit of curiosity, but then it sort of meandered into uh, all sorts of rabbit holes. And uh, currently, it's been supported by three different organizations. It's the uh, Ethereum Foundation in form of grants, and also by Infura, uh, by um, doing contracts with me and Interchain Foundation as well. You probably know about Interchain Foundation by the Cosmos product. Um, so let's start. So I'm going to skip all the slides that I had before because you've probably seen them. So we start right from the meat about what is the difference between the geth and turbo geth. And so on the slide you could see on the left hand side you could see like the in Ethereum the, the, the state of accounts and the contracts and the, their storage is modeled as the Patricia tree, which is essentially a radix tree of the radix 16 with some refinements to be able to get rid of some some um, uh, waste of uh, waste of space, and uh, when you model it like that, and you want to persist it in a database, the persistence you looks like on the on the right hand side, which is the key of the. So it, it basically the whole structure, every node in this Patricia tree is split and is one record in a database, and for that record, the key is the the, the hash of the uh, serialization of this node, and the value is the serialization itself. What it allows us to do is um, let's pretend that we, we do not have that pink node in the top, like the diamond pink node, and instead we, we simply have uh, a hash, which, is a, which you could see that is a little uh, um, dark, and dark rectangle. So what we could do is that we could take that hash and then use it as the key in the database and look up the um, serialization of that pink node and, and reconstruct it and then plug it into the tree. So that's how uh, basically uh, pretty much all the clients do that, as far as I know. Um, and so the, the 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 problem that so that when I first saw it actually uh, I it, I was a bit surprised because for me it wasn't it wouldn't be how I would do it, and that's why I actually started on this process because whenever I see something which doesn't look like I expected this is where you, so I didn't expect to see that but probably was very uh, natural for other people. So the main problem here that I saw is that, let's say that when you when you're only have a root uh, and nothing else in the memory, and then you, you want to fetch, that, let's say, element V5, which is the, the purple uh, diamond in the, on, on the bottom right, you actually have to do um, one, two, three lookups to the database. And the reason for that is because in order to retrieve the, 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 the that diamond, you have to first retrieve the element before that because it contains its hash. So and then so and vice versa. So you have to do three sequential lookups to the database. You cannot parallelize them because you, there's a data dependency there. Um, so that um, gave me the idea of um, not doing that. So basically, the, you see in the red matters, depth should not matter. It means that how can we do that without doing three lookups or five lookups or seven lookups or whatever? I think at the moment, on average, it will be eight or, or nine lookups if you don't go through from the root. So uh, what I uh, tried to do is that, okay, let's just put them in a database as I would expect it to be. Like, you've got a key, which is the, which is the actual key of the value that you want to store, and the value is the actual value that you want to store. And if it's a hist historical value, then we're going we're gonna to append uh, some kind of block uh, number encoded in some way to the key, just for, for simplicity. And uh, the, the, the main problem here is that how are we going to compute the remarkable hash of that? And I think uh, initially when the, the first clients have been produced, uh, the assumption was that, oh, that's going to be super expensive to actually have this flat representation and then to rebuild the whole tree. And then everybody decided to go, okay, let's do the this do Patricia tree in, in a database. But then I said, well, why not? Let's try. And then I tried that, and actually it turned out that you can do things much, uh, well, in a lot of cases much faster if you simply rebuild the, the, the hash tree on the, on the fly. And you use some caching and stuff like this. So the way it looks like, in, imagine that we need to, um, um, to get the, to this uh, pink diamond now. Uh, with, with the pink diamond, we just uh, we just simply fetch it. But actually, let's me, let let's say that we want to compute the the, the hash of that uh, the oval 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 that dash thing. So in this case, we do a range query, which will fetch us all the keys and values, uh, which starts with one, which is the actually might be might be the, the picture might be wrong. But anyway, so 
you probably get the idea. So we get the range of keys and values, and then we uh, apply our merkleization to them, and we get the, the hash. The, it only kind of works for, this, for the current state, uh, um, and uh, if you want to, to compute the Merkle hashes of the current state, but for historical state, it's, uh, it's a kind of a lot of work, because you don't usually store the historical state in your cache. But uh, it, it works reasonably well for, for the RPC queries that are tested. So let's go, so, so as I mentioned that Infura has been supporting this project for, for some time, and one of the things we did is that instead of me only running the TurboGuest on my machines or some cloud machines, they tried to run it out of the source code, and this is what happened. And I was kind of pleasantly surprised because I, I, I must have been running it on the really bad machines before. So now I usually got uh, two weeks to sync it, but this was actually synced in about six and a half days. Yeah, six and a half days. And uh, the, this to the pretty recent block, and the it's archive node actually, so it has a full un, 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 unrolled history, and it only uh, was what 200, 250 something gigabytes, which was cool because it's probably six times less than you would normally get. And just as an interesting thing, that the memory profile. So the what you can see here is that the the yellow oscillating bit is that. It's obviously Go, it has a garbage collection, and that's why it's oscillating so much. It's, um, it's basically allocated heap, which goes into about 13 gig maximum, and you can see the spike about the, the, the spam attacks where the, it was a big load. And the green bit is the, is the number of nodes. So what TurboGet does actually, one of the things it does differently as well, is that you can limit number of nodes that you can, of, the, of the tree you can store in a cache. And that might allow you. So my hope was that you can use that to calibrate uh, the, the, the heap space, but you know, I think um, it might still be constantly increasing. So now what I, so now look at the, these uh, graph. So what you can see, this is the recent, well, quite recent, maybe one month old uh, graph. Um, and this is where the, the actually the cost of storage comes from. Most of it is now block bodies, which is the, essentially this is all the blocks combined for like six million blocks. And then the, the second biggest uh, structure is the called the block, this is like a gray one, block number to changed keys. This is the structure which is a specific to TurboGeth and it allows it to, to know which accounts and which storage indices changed at which block. And why do we need this is because it, it allows us to do, uh, uh, to rewind the state quickly. So uh, in a situation where, let's say that we've been like syncing to the main chain and then uh, we suddenly see rework of like four blocks. So what the TurboGet does, it actually looks at this uh, mapping and figures out which keys changed in these four blocks, uh, then picks up the values which were before these four blocks and then uh, unwinds the, the, the tree in the hash and then computes a new hash and then reapplies the, the, the state on a, on a fork, on a Delta fork. And so um, what you do not see here is, uh, is, is the receipts. Uh, you can have them there. Uh, they would take about six, 70 to 80 gigabytes of all receipts from the beginning. And uh, I will show you later why would want you want to do that. Um, but um, the interesting bit to note is that uh, lots of people are confused about the size of the state in Ethereum. And, uh, and the reason why they're confused is because different clients store the state differently. Like, like for example, Go Ethereum, current state uh, representation in Go Ethereum will probably like 80 gigabytes, 90 gigabytes. In TurboGuest, it's probably gonna be about 12 gigabytes. I don't know how it's gonna be in parity, but it's it, it, different clients store it differently. And sometimes people confuse the current state with the like total historical state, with the pruned historical state. That's why it's, but what you can see from this picture, on the very uh, top, you can see accounts, which is 3.89 gigabytes. This is the account without any storage items. It just simply balances, nonces, um, uh, hashes of the, of, the, of the storage routes and the code hashes. And the whole, no, it's not the whole history, it's the current accounts. So the history of accounts you can see on the left, on the yellow bit, so 44 gigabytes. Then the uh, storage of the contracts, the, cur the current state is what, 10 gigabytes? You can see it somewhere down the middle, the purple uh, violet bit. And then you can see the history of, it's, it's about 26 gigabytes. So you can see that the current state is still kind of about 12 gigabytes probably. Now, uh, so this is, the, this is where I'm gonna say about receipts because I haven't tested all, ex all entire, entire 
uh, set of RPCs. And again, these numbers are very rough. I didn't do scientific uh, studies on this, but this is what I just saw very, after very quick running. I run the both archive geth and turbo geth on the same machine, and obviously there would be lots of noise, but I could see through this noise that uh, generally the things are going faster, except for the receipts. And the reason that for that is because I chose to prune the receipts from the database, and instead I just recompute them. So when uh, the, somebody asks me for a receipt, I just go to the state where that was at that block, and after that transaction, I just re-execute re the transaction, produce a receipt, return them. It turns out to be slower. Actually, this might be not 10 times, maybe a bit more slower. But somebody told me that maybe it just needs to be a flag, because some people, the only thing they do is actually querying receipts. So for those people, they might be able to, might want to pay 70 gigs for, for speed of that RPC. So now, the other thing I did in, uh, quite recently in TurboGeth is that uh, I have prepared it for the pruning, but I haven't implemented pruning yet. So, but I made sure that the pruning can be done uh, pretty trivially. And so the idea here is that instead of, so, so what you could see in this diagram, so every bubble, every little circle is actually a record in a database. And so the, uh, the, th the arrows, like the thick arrows, they, they represent that the, each, the, each of these uh, circles is basically a representation of the state for that period of time. So let's say that the green circle on the right is the current state. It means that the current state has been for that, like if you look, look at the top one, for the last, uh, let's say, seven blocks or eight blocks, I don't see it exactly, this was the current state. And it hasn't been changed for seven or eight blocks, right? And before that, there was this yellow bit, which was uh, since we know, and, and so on. So the red bit is uh, where uh, something gets deleted. For example, the account gets deleted, then I mark it as a red, we put it as a record as well. And also that you could see that the blank uh, blue one, this is where something just first been created and there was nothing in bit before. So now what we can do is that, what I, I call it reverse diffs uh, instead of forward diffs, and what it allows you to do is this. So if you basically chop off the, the left bit, then you can just keep running your, your node because you still have everything, everything is still consistent. So you can still query the state at any point that you have a history for. If you, if you try to do it with the forward diffs, that would be difficult. Uh, because you would have to, when you chop, the, chop this up, you would have to rebuild the current state at the, at the point of the chop. Uh, because everything is, 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 rel is, is re relative to, the, to the some, some sort of previous snapshot. So, as, as I said, I haven't implemented yet, but it's trivial. Now, light clients. I mean, here I actually mean light server. And at the moment it's not implemented. And the reason for that is because I simply don't store any hashes in a database. And I, I kind of do, but not much, only, in the, only for the current state. So what the light clients actually need, you can see on the right-hand side all the ticks that the last two protocol needs all this support of all these things. And the ones that I can't, currently cannot provide is these, the ones which I pointed with the red arrows, which is no data and proofs, right? So no data will be very difficult in any way because it's specific to, it turns out to be specific to the way that current clients store the, the, the state and it will be very difficult for me to implement that because it's actually, you cannot come up with any hash in history or in the current state which I have no idea where, which block it is from and you're supposed to give me, I supposed to give you the, 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 the node for that and I don't have idea where to look for it in my database because my database is structured by the blocks. The get proof is, more, is easier for me because it, at least it tells me at which block and at which account to look for so I can actually find it. So it's easier to implement that and maybe uh, I know that the light clients can ask for proofs not for the current state but, but for, for some delayed state but it could be done. But, um, and, the, and then there's another problem which I encountered recently. I call it create to revival problem. And it's also actually, this, this is also to inform people about something which is coming up in Constantinople. It's, it is not in the mainnet yet, by the way. Don't get, get scared. It's the, uh, so create to opcode uh, essentially uh, is, is introduced to allow uh, efficient uh, counterfactual instantiation. And, uh, and, and the way it does it, is that if you look at the formula of the uh, address computation, it, it includes address, which is basically the creator of this contract, salt, which could be chosen at, at, at will, 
and then init code, which is something which will be executed to generate the actual deployed code. So that means that you, you, you can, in theory and in practice, uh, recreate the contracts after they've been self-destructed. So in this diagram, the big circles is the, is the contract, and the small circles is the storage items of the contract. And you can see that uh, how contract was created, and storage has been modified, blah, blah, blah. And then it got to the point where it got self-destructed, and you got all these red things. And then later on, in the, like three blocks later, it's been recreated using create2 with the same code or with a different code, but with the same init code. And then after that, you're supposed to, so it, it's assumed that now at this point, the the, uh, the the storage is cleared and balance is cleared. So this is completely empty contract. And now you can start again. So the problem for TurboGeth is that because it doesn't store the, the, the state as a tree, but rather in a, this relational way, it has to either insert all these red bubbles into, into the database, which could be in millions, potentially, at the, at the point of self-destruction, or it has to apply much uh, more, more in nuanced uh, way when you actually fetch the contract item. So uh, alternative would be to, like when, whenever anybody asks me for the contract storage, I would have to also check whether the contract has been self-destructed in the past and when it was the last time. So it's more searching. I can implement it, but it's kind of a bit a uh, hassle. Now, so this is, uh, this is highly experimental. This is, uh, this is something that I, I came up with when I was thinking about all these problems that with the light clients and with the, with the create two, and at the same time I was I was working with the Ethermint team, and they basically we we did some tests with the loading Ethereum transaction at Ethermint, and it turns out to be a bit slow. So I said we need to be we need to get faster with that, and so the idea is to actually create a spe specialized database that would allow uh, these few uh, desirable things. And I will explain why they are uh, they might be good. It's, it's still very experimental, so it's it could also it all co turned out to be in a different way. So uh, although I did some proof of concept on this, I will tell you roughly what the results were. So let's get into the the details of that. So um, as you know, again, as I told you before, is about the, the Ethereum currently uses Patricia tree for miraculization, but also it, it, it's it's it's. Um, before inserting everything, anything in the Patricia tree, it also applies the hash function to the key. So the keys are not just inserted as they are. And this is because in back in 2000, whenever, 15, I think, when, when there was a security audit of Ethereum, something pointed out by Andrew Miller uh, that you could actually create a very, um, very long branches in that tree uh, but attacker could do that and then basically introduce some, some bad things. So as a mitigation, it has been suggested to hash all the keys before inserting them into the Patricia tree. And the idea is that it would kind of balance them out. There is a, it still doesn't completely solve the problem, but we're not gonna touch it right now. So for the Ethereum 2.0, for example, there's also suggestion of a sparse miracle tree, which is essentially also radix tree, but with a different radix. Instead of radix 16, they use radix 2. And, but the idea is very similar. And for the same exact reason, the keys will have to be hashed. And the reason I don't like the hashed keys is firstly because I, I believe that the, the, the problem pointed out in security audit has not been completely resolved, and it will keep persisting if we stick with the sparse Merkle trees. And also, you also have to keep pre-images, so to be able to iterate through the state. And the pre-images are not really heavy at the moment, but in, I just chopped the bit out of the diagram. It's about 15 gigs. So what I've been experimenting with, and of course it's, it's, been, it's, been, um, it's been inspired by the, by the fact that, um, um, that, that uh, Ethermint uses the AVO trees, uh, looking at the balancing trees, and uh, the, the main objection to balancing trees uh, was that I the order of insertion and deletion actually matters. Um, and I've been looking at not only AVO trees, but also the weight balance trees. Actually, really little known about them, but these are the structures which are really good for functional languages for some reason. So actually, what the idea is that, okay, let's try to encode the structure in a, as a string of bits. So this is actually, you're probably going to look at the slides later, but so this is to demonstrate to you that you can encode the, any, any binary tree, in fact, into the string of bits with the cost of at most two bits per item, and then decode them with a very simple state machine, as I provide here. Uh, so the decoding allows you ad to either rebuild the whole tree or actually compute Merkle hash efficiently. And then what you do next is that you have this uh, huge tree, which is balanced, 
and you would merkleize it uh, according to this huge tree. And then in order to efficiently store it in database, you split it into pages of the fixed size. And this is kind of the schematics of how you would do it. Then after you do that, you encode them in the pages, and this is the structure of the page I'm using in proof of concept. It's got like different uh, elements in that. And uh, what is interesting here is the page pointer. So there's two elements stored in, in the pages that the, the values, uh, the, you can see that FP there, and this is the circle with the arrows are the pointers. And so then after that, you can actually add the history. So um, so the main, um, so let's, let's talk about this. So, uh, first of all, in order to explain more in, in a short uh, sentence is that the main idea is that you use the same structure for the database index as, you, the, as the structure that you use for merkleization. So it's the same. So that means that whenever you actually commit something into a database, it doesn't move anymore because it's in exactly the, same pl in exactly the place where it's supposed to be according to the, to the index of the database, which means that right amplification equals, the basically right amplification does not happen. And so the database just grows. It doesn't keep rewriting things on a disk. It just simply adds things, which is, has some nice properties. So at the moment, uh, uh, with my proof of concept, which I've been running, I was comparing with Trubegeth, which is also uh, quite um, already high bar. Um, so the right so the the right efficiency has been about seven times better than in Turbogeth, so it means that uh, it actually has a set seven times less I.O. Unfortunately, the space efficiency has decreased compared to Turbogeth. It's about four times less uh, space efficient uh, in the current numbers. But I have a, some, some I, I know some ways how you can improve that. Access efficiency, I only superficially tested that. So. And so what the, the, this, uh, to, to put it in perspective is that uh, people usually talk about the trade-off of three things in databases, update efficiency, space efficiency, and access efficiency. Um, and you can see that you really want to be in, inside this triangle on that plane, but you, don't, you not, never really know whether you're above that triangle, which means that you're, you don't actually have an efficient trade-off, optimal trade-off, or you're in a, in a triangle. So what I'm trying to do is that I, I posit that non-optimized systems are already above, are actually above the triangle, so they're not really, uh, exercising trade-offs at all, so they're inefficient in any way, in any possible way, but uh, what I'm trying to do now is uh, trying to, hopefully, I am inside the triangle already, and trying to navigate uh, between them. So I'm gonna, if it's any time, I'm gonna take any questions. Any time for questions, or? Yes, yeah, there's some time for questions. Yeah, I, sorry, I rushed I'll run the mic I, to you if you have any questions. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so just that I understand it, this 200 gigabytes or 200 plus 70 for the receipts, that's actually an archive node, right? Yeah, it's an archive node. Ooh, nice. Yeah, and it can, it can uh, uh, fetch you any data for the entire history through any RPC queries. Um. Uh, can you talk more about this range request? Oh, uh, range request. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's basically... Um, So range request is quite simple because essentially you are, in most of these key value stores, what you can do, you can uh, open the cursor at a certain, you can, you can seek to the certain key. For example, in this case, it will be one with some zero, 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 whatever the first key is to start with one, and then you just use that iterator to iterate through them until you see uh, two in the, in, the, in the first position. That's a uh, range query. It's not like SQL, but it, it's still possible efficiently. Yeah, Alexi, can you talk a little bit more about um, your experiment with Ethermint and why? It was oh yes, slow? I forgot about that. Sorry. Yeah. So the Ethermint experiment is interesting for me because um, at the moment when I only try to optimize the Turbogeth, and uh, there is a Patricia tree, which I already uh, I, I said that I don't like it very much, but uh, and it's it's encoded in the yellow paper. But what I, I want to kind of look behind, beyond the yellow paper, maybe because, uh, because it's cool, because, because I want to s search for different structures, maybe because they're gonna be used in ETH.2 or 2.0, or because a, you know, we, we might be able, be able to create something more efficient in Ethermint, and then we could just transplant this into the Ethereum. Uh, it, it's probably good for experimentation. I also quite like working with the Ethermint team, so they so yeah, it's, uh, that's the reason. But, and 
We was there any one um, more question? Was there any like performance difference when you were doing Ethermint versus Ethermint is on our very early stages, and uh, the, the whole reason why I started to do this Morris thing is because the first performance tests were not satisfactory to me, so I wanted that to be faster. Um, we probably have time for one more question. Um, first of all, I just wanted to ask, do you realize how amazing you are? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Flattering. Um, and then secondly, um, can you just go into a little bit more detail of how you come from 1.3 terabytes to 250 gigabytes with the same, it feels like the same performance, uh, but a very significant decrease in the size? How, how exactly did that? Well, um, there, it comes from two things. First of all, I don't store any hashes, and the hashes are probably one of the biggest contributors to the to the space in in, in existing clients. And secondly, um, the the um, the tree structure uh, when you model the the history as a tree structure, it repeats a lot of the elements on closer to the root when you create a new version. So that repetition also that it also contributes to the might uh, to the the Morris being less space efficient because it's also tree based. So and uh, th that's basically two reasons. And if you remove these two things, that becomes uh, super space efficient. Um. All right. Well, thank you very much, Alexi. Yeah, thank you for it's coming. Been great.